All righty, here we go. This is Steven Ramsden. And everyone nod up and down if you're getting video and audio. Awesome. We got some new faces this week. We had about four other people in the waiting room, but I'm not sure what happened. I'm sure they'll come back and join us. Uh, this is This Week in Birding and Nature Photography on Sunlit Earth. My name is Steven Ramsden. I am the director of the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project. It is a global nonprofit that's been around since 2008, named in memoriam to my fellow veteran and air traffic controller, Charlie Bates, who died in 2007. So what we do is teach people about the sun, solar physics, solar spectroscopy, uh, all that kind of good stuff in 27 countries around the world. In 2017, after the total eclipse, we started Sunlit Earth, which is our domestic, um, oh, there's some more people coming in. Sunlit Earth is our North American affiliate and we talk about sunlight in nature. Um, it's a nonprofit 501c3 in the United States, uh, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. And this show is content for the quarantine weary. And I picked two o'clock on Saturday because uh, generally everybody's done with their birding by that time in the Eastern time zone. And our affiliates in, uh, in the UK and in Eastern Europe and North Africa, it's still early enough in the daytime uh, where they don't have to stay up until midnight. Midnight, as you can see, there's Alexandra checking in from, uh, excuse me, from the UK. And we get visitors from all over the world. Some visitors we don't like, uh, but I've taken some more security steps this week to make sure we don't have any more um, porn videos playing during our meeting. So um, Richard Clark is with us this week. I'm glad to see him. He's gonna be a guest on an upcoming show. I think you're really gonna enjoy. Um, is a, a pretty interesting person from what I can tell from Facebook and just having a brief conversation with him. Connie, thanks for coming in. Rebecca and Dwayne, the Sealings, who are our fellow birders, and uh, Alexander from the UK. So what's going on this week with birds? Uh, you know, we have been freezing. Hold on. Why is Alexander big? There we go. <laughs> We have been freezing uh, all across North America and probably most of Europe as well. So uh, to be honest, I haven't been out doing a lot of birding. I've been doing some microscopy from the house and had some live uh, tardigrades earlier today and yesterday. Um, but we have still had some remarkable uh, photos posted on Sunlit Earth. And if it's okay with you, I was just going to go over a couple of those. We saw a, uh, what's a tardigrade you say? Um, a tardigrade is this, and they look nothing like this in a microscope, but um, that's the internet version. But they do look a lot like that, the same shape, and you can see the mouth and the uh, um, legs and everything else. But just quickly, I'll show you what it actually looks like uh, in the microscope. And, and why I show this? Well, because these animals are also uh, indirect results of sunlight and you know the the legs are visible the head is on the left here the uh, butt is on the right these are bilateral organisms which is a word I'm sure all of you know but bilateral was a step in uh, evolution that was really beneficial to us because it put our mouths on the other side of our body from our booties so that we didn't have to ingest and excrete from the same hole so bilateral was a big step in evolution. The tardigrades are a really good example of that in the protozoa world. Um, we also had a uh, pale-eyed eastern towhee, a white-eyed eastern towhee, which may not be that fantastic for a lot of people, but for us uh, in 20 degree wind chill, that's a great bird. And um, Steve Rushing caught a picture of this in his yard the other day. Um, and I'm gonna try to bring that one up just one moment. As you can see, um, I'm an internet genius and our show is very informal and we invite anyone to break in with any comments they want at any time. Here's the uh, pale, the white eyed uh, Eastern towhee. And you know, most of our towhees here in Georgia have red eyes and down south in Florida, there's some more people in the waiting room. Let me uh, let them in real quick if I know them. Joe Sexton, awesome. Julie Wood, awesome. Good. 
So most of our, our towies here in Atlanta are red-eyed towies. This one has a, obviously a white eye, and that was a pretty exciting thing to see, uh, for me at least. And I was able to stay outside for about two hours before my hands went numb and went back inside. And then this photograph, let me see if that's still sharing properly. This is our um, golden crowned kinglet that Steve Rushing also took a photo of over at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. And all you locals know about the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve, but um, Richard, you may not know about it. It's, it's uh, six miles away and I'm one of the people that run it. So I kind of got hoisted into that job because I was retired and had some free time. So I really enjoy working over there and taking care of the bird habitat. And this golden crown kinglet is real special for us. We don't get a lot of these. And the thing I like about it most is, is you can always see its golden crown as opposed to the ruby crown kinglet, which you have to get them angry before they flash their red at you. So that was another interesting um, bird we had this week. And I see Julie Wood is back, thanks. And Joe Sexton, first time uh, visitor. And let's see if he's, yeah, there he is, he's smiling. Joe is a, uh, he's muted still. Joe's a doctorate holding biologist who's gonna give us a little bit of information on some trees over at Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve, which I'm looking forward to. But this week's super special guest is my friend, Emil Powella and his wife, Nancy, who I've never met, but I've heard about. And all uh, Emil ever says is positive, beautiful things about you. Um, he rants and raves and brags about how lucky he is to have such an awesome wife. I wanted to tell you that. Um, all my fellow husbands will thank me for that. Um, Thanks. Emil, are you getting good audio from us? <laughs> yeah, your your uh, your promotional picture of us from forty years ago was really a good one too. On uh, I like on... that. <laughs> we look exactly the same now, so I didn't even notice it was different until you pointed it out. He looks a lot more the same than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, um, uh, Emil, is it Emil, right? Emil. 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 Uh, Emil Powella. Now I'm no linguistics expert, but that's uh, that's Korean, right? Uh, it is not. Oh, it's not. Okay, I'm kidding. It's actually, um, <laughs> it's a made-up name. It's Italian, and when my grandparents arrived at Ellis Island in 1916, that was not their name. And the folks in the line said, "Your name is too difficult, you Italian people," because their name was Paolo. And so they said, "Let's make this look a little more American. They will give you Powell." And let's put an A on the end to make you feel oh. Italian. And there you are. That's is that it. how you pronounce it still? Powella? Powella. Yeah, it's Powella. It was Powella. Powella. Awesome. Powella. Yep. Well, um, Emil and I met at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve, and he has become a uh, fixture there and around local birding areas. And we are going to go through some of his favorite photos and tell some stories about it. Um, again, for those that just tuned in, Richard Clark is with us this week, who's going to be a guest on an upcoming show. He's been a photographer as long as some of us have been alive and he's gonna talk about his bird studio and all that kind of cool stuff. And thanks for joining us, Richard. Um, Julie Wood, first time attendee. Uh, she and I have looked at many barred owls together um, <laughs> and I'll go around the room and we'll talk, hey, Rafael Colon Romano in the Dominican Republic. And we've got the UK representative uh, with Alexander Hart. And Joe, uh, Joe, can you unmute yourself and were you gonna, talk to us a little bit this week or are you just attending to listen in for the first time? Yep, we can't hear you. We are not getting your audio. All right, work on that, Joe. He's got a doctorate, but he can't figure out his microphone and that's pretty <laughs> much the rest of us. Um, we're all pretty highly educated in here, but um, you know, today's world of IT is geared towards the 12 year old video game player and everyone always has problems and it's kind of funny to make fun of them while they're having problems. We have no audio from you, Joe. So work it out. I would suggest clicking your, um, your little mute button arrow to the right of your mute button and making sure you have the right microphone selected. Now you're muted again. And now it's turned off his video. I love Joe Sexton. Joe Sexton is on the board with us over at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. And um, he's also gonna come on over the next uh, few weeks for 10 or 15 minutes on every show, hopefully, and talk about bioluminescence in nature, which is one of his specialties. Uh, he's worked in the COVID task force at the CDC. 
as a biologist, and he's also um, pretty uh, versed in in flora and fauna of the nature preserve. So we're looking forward to that. Um, Connie, what's going on over over at your place? Have you have you had a magnificent frigate bird in your yard today? I have not. I have had a red holder, shouldered hawk in my yard, awesome. but um, it's pretty quiet over at my place. That that reminds me, um, we are in Atlanta. Like I said, the show's coming to you from Atlanta. A lot of the guests here are from Atlanta. And this is the time to see barred owls and red shouldered hawks uh, with their babies. Okay, because they are all, the ones that are going to reproduce are all currently in their nests or uh, making their nests, if not already have laid eggs. And I'm trying to find the photo. Yesterday or two days ago, I was just rolling around uh, in the woods and looked up and there was a red shouldered hawk sitting in its nest on eggs. And yeah, it's a very common bird, but you know, uh, if you're nerdy like me, every time I see this, it, it just makes me smile. I wish it was a, a barred owl, but um, let's see. I have been seeing a red fox in my neighbor's yard and that was pretty exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh. Um, I'd <laughs> we don't get those in Midtown Atlanta. We did have a prowler uh, running around our yard this morning. Um, a guy wearing a Ralph Lauren outfit, carrying a backpack, uh, just prowling through the yards, going in people's backyards. And, uh, and, and, you know, I almost had to shoot him with my pellet gun, but he took off just in time. Yeah, so this is the red-shouldered hawk. I think I'm sharing the right screen. No, I'm not, hold on. Uh, new share. There we go. That's the little red-shouldered hawk sitting in a, in a nest. And you know, um, those of you that know me locally know that I had all of my camera gear stolen back in November and I'm still waiting for replacement lenses. So this is using a, a 100 millimeter macro lens and cropped down to about 1 30th of the frame. Uh, this bird was about 75 feet up in a pine tree. But thanks to Topaz Denoise and my limited skills learned from Buddy Harrell, I was able to pull a photograph out of this. And this is the red-shouldered hawk sitting on some eggs up in their nest. And we're really looking forward to seeing um, to seeing some babies come out of that nest. So we love birding. Uh, we love sunlight. Everything you've ever seen, uh, any speck of beauty uh, you've ever noticed in the world is illuminated by sunlight during the daytime outside. And we think that that is a super cool thing. So the other part of our, of our nonprofit sets up solar telescopes and teaches the visible light spectrum. Um, to students around the world. We've taught directly to over 1 million students in the last 11 years. And that's not handing them a pamphlet and saying, see you later. That's sitting down for an hour with the students and showing them telescopes. Raphael does that in the Dominican Republic with our equipment. Uh, Alexandra does that sometimes with her own equipment. She's more on the internet sharing solar astronomy. She's one of the best known astro imagers in the world. And let's see, Bonnie Dotson just joined us. She's a sponsored uh, photographer on Sunlit Earth. Rebecca and her husband are photographers and Amel is a photographer. Joe Sexton is a hippie. Uh, is your audio working yet, Joe? Joe, no uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on, man. Hey guys, yeah, thanks for um, doing these. Um, even though it's my first time joining live, I've enjoyed watching these, you know, at night, maybe at the end of the day, once I get the kids in bed to watch some of these. And, you know, I really enjoy it. I've, I've learned a lot. And it's cool to put faces to it. I see a lot of you guys posting and all your beautiful pictures on Sunlit Earth, um, Richard Clark, Buddy, and Raphael. Those are, I recognize all of you guys. And I know Rebecca and uh, Bonnie from Clyde Shepherd, but you guys all have incredible photos. So thanks so much for sharing those. Um, I really enjoy it. And I'm, I'm not really a photographer, but I do enjoy nature and the natural world. Um, I have a background in biology. I started off just doing research in anything that I could, you know, started off doing insect ecology, did invasive species research with crabs, and eventually kind of narrowed down into microbiology. And that's really where I specialize. Um, so I, I love the biological world and all, all different angles. And I do hope to come on and do 
more focused um, talk about um, biological sources of light. I know Stephen is, is a big fan of light and focusing on the sunlight. Um, but there's some really cool, the, the biological sources of light I think is really interesting. Um, so I hope to come on and talk about that. I'm really here more just to listen today. Um, although if, if there's a few minutes, I, just thinking about the uh, theme of this, I was thinking it might be kind of cool to talk about some of the things people have registered on iNaturalist over the past few weeks at Clyde Shepherd. I don't know if, if it would be a good time to spend five minutes looking at some of those. Can't hear you, Stephen. Can you guys hear me? Why can't I hear you? I, I can hear you, but I can't hear Stephen. All right, so it's not me. It's oh, there you go. Yeah, I said Emil was asking to come back in the meeting, and I'm uh, here. He is now, and Emil, if you wouldn't mind giving us about three minutes, Joe is sharing a couple oh. of things. I think we got it changed. So okay, very good. Can you hang on just for two or three minutes? And there's no time limit on this meeting. Okay, That's super. So no big deal. Don't get flustered, Emil. Okay. I was, but I'm not. All right, good. <laughs> Joe. Yeah. Um. Can I share my screen for a second? Yes. Well, I don't know. Can you? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> hey. All right. Awesome. You guys. You guys can see my screen mute myself and you i'm gonna give you you know five or ten minutes so if you guys are, are you guys familiar with iNaturalist who here is familiar with iNaturalist i am i see some hands so iNaturalist is really cool and I, I, the more i learn about it the more excited i am um, to engage people with it but essentially it's a it's a database where People can take pictures of animals that they see and upload them. And then that serves as a form of a record. And, and I like it too, because it takes pressure off the person taking the picture to be an expert. It really revolves around a community of people to confirm identity. And um, so it actually provides a really cool citizen science based surveillance process. And so Stephen and Someone else, Wes, somebody that I actually don't know, helped set up a project for Clyde Shepherd. So if anybody goes to Clyde Shepherd and takes a picture of an animal to Clyde Shepherd, it, it shows up in the project based on the GPS that's automatic. The, like the user doesn't have to do that. Um, so it, it's cool. And especially, you know, like Stephen being a board member of Clyde Shepherd, I think it's really useful because it provides a record of what species have been documented there. So I just thought I'd take a minute and talk about a few things that have been seen recently. Um, over 700 observations have been made at Clyde Shepherd on iNaturalist, but we'll just talk about a few recent ones. I'd like to highlight uh, the slimy and redback salamander. Um, it's a great time to see both of these guys. They're one of the more common things observed at Clyde Shepherd. And I think they're really cool because they're actually, they actually breed terrestrially. Um, I don't know how many people know that, but you know most salamanders need a pond or a creek or some body of water. They can actually lay their eggs in the dirt, you know, in rotting wood. Um, so that's kind of cool. I also wanted to take a minute and zoom in on this hackberry. So Dave Butler is one of the other uh, board members at Clyde Shepherd, and he's an arborist. He's really knowledgeable about trees. So I'm always asking him about trees when we're there. And the hackberry is, um, it's not rare by any means, but it has a really uh, distinct bark texture. Um, they say it has a warty kind of bark, uh, texture bark. And I, I started um, reading about this and it's actually a really cool tree because in addition to having berries that a lot of our birds like, you know, one of the things that brings people to Clyde Shepherd. Um, it, it's also the only host plant for the hackberry emperor, which is a really beautiful butterfly. Um, it, it can only reproduce on the hackberry. And so we've got a few hackberries growing at Clyde Shepherd. And I think that's something to uh, 
to um, be proud of. Here's another picture of the Hackberry Emperor. Oh yeah, cool. And here you can see how it lays its eggs on the surface of the leaf. Um, can't reproduce or feed on other plants, only the hackberry. Um, there's its caterpillar phase. And this is a, this is a great article uh, the University of Florida has about the hackberry. Now, and actually, I, sorry, go I, ahead, Stephen. I, I was going to say, I took that photo of the uh, the southern redback salamander, and I, I was, my wife was um, talking to me a minute ago. Uh, did you say that also breeds on dry land? Yes. I did not know that. And you know, um, just like last year, this is the best time of year to see salamanders at Clyde Shepherd right now. And they're, they're all over the place underneath these logs. So if anybody wants to go look at them in your local, I'll be glad to take you over and show you how to find them. But they're, they're all over the place over there. Yeah, and, and there's uh, some great resources for salamander information here. Um, the Amphibian Foundation, is based in Atlanta and also there's a project um, doing surveillance of salamanders in metro Atlanta it's called the MAAMP and so you can learn more about these. Very good now you mentioned that you might be able to um, to do a, a, a full episode with us about bioluminescence. Right. Okay and is this going to be like factual stuff or just stuff that you make up on the fly after like smoking a dupe? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, either way, yeah. will be entertaining for us. Um, yeah. And not not to cut it short or anything, but so so I naturalist anybody can use it and just take a photograph and it automatically pins it to the location that Wes Hatch and I created for Clyde Shepherd. And this is a great tool for keeping track of all the species, right? Exactly. And and also it captures the time of year, so you can um, right. You know. I think visitors can look at this and say, oh, these are some of the things I might see today when I go visit Clyde Shepherd because other people are recording them. And I, I was just gonna make two other quick highlights. Um, this pear-shaped puffball mushroom, you guys probably see that growing alongside the trail. Fun fact is it's also called the wolf fart fungus. I thought, you know, my four-year-old thought that was cool. Maybe you guys, maybe this is the wrong crowd for, for that. Kind he of said wolf fart fungus. That's okay. exactly right, Stephen. That's right. Um, and then the oyster mushroom. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, yeah, there's a lot cool. of that at Clyde Shepherd. And you can actually see some of it fruiting if you go, not the main entrance, but the one further down um, the road. There's some logs right there, and there's some oyster mushrooms fruiting off that right now. Um, so those are some of the things people are seeing right now. At this point, I'll, I should probably turn it back over to Amal. Um, and that well, I'm, I can tell you now that I want to invite you as as the guest for a show because I want you to talk some more about these things because, you know, it's it's we got a great asset in having Joe Sexton here uh, nearby and the guy knows a lot about what he's talking about. So um, if I can uh, get you on the show for a full episode, that would be great. And yeah. um, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about it, Joe. Hope you'll be able to stay tuned for a little more of this show. Um, OK, so. I was walking through uh, the nature preserve where Joe is also a board member. And I saw this, this uh, little guy shooting, uh, <laughs> nothing personal. Um, everybody's a little guy to me. And uh, he was taking pictures at the bird feeders. And, you know, I'm a pretty friendly guy, but I kind of look like uh, an a-hole and people don't normally come up to me and start yapping to me because I look like I've, I'm some kind of psycho. Um, but Amo, immediately was friendly and smiling and started talking, 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 talking to me. And, you know, I don't mind listening to people talk. I like it, but he can tell a good story and very, uh, um, what's the word? Okay. Literate, uh, uh, extensive vocabulary and can tell a good story. So, Emil, thanks for being on the show. And tell us a little bit about, about yourself and, and, and your wife and, and what's going on over there, man. Okay, all right. Uh, Stephen, thank you. And yes, I remember very well when that menacing looking character showed up uh, near the bird feeders. But uh, a life of being a marketing guy, which is what my career was before I, I retired, um, taught me that as long as you can run faster than they can, you can engage anybody. So we did. And um, had we've had some really good conversations around at Clyde Shepherd. I, I really enjoy it. 
Stephen loves that place. And, and I'm just someone who believes in passion. I love somebody who's passionate about what they do. He loves the sun, you know, and I mean, how, yeah. And so, you know, that's, uh, that just connected with me. And so uh, background, I'm a, I'm a retired person, been retired for quite a while now. Uh, my lovely wife, Nancy, and I have been married for 52 years. Oh, my goodness. I know they don't usually let people that are three years old marry, but <laughs> 52 years in December. Um, and we've, we, I think we've got this thing pretty well together. Do you think um, you're going to stay together, Emil? Um, yeah, I, I'm good. I'd be not, I'd be worthless on the dating scene. That's the way I see it. So the, uh, uh, in any case, Nancy is a retired uh, pastor, Christian pastor. And I was in the oil industry in oil marketing and I'm retired. And, uh, and so we live here in Lilburn, Georgia. It's a little, uh, for those folks not in the Atlanta area, we're about 15 miles east of downtown. I'm probably about six miles from the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve where I met Stephen. And um, what, I would, what I would say to y'all, and, and I know Buddy Harrell's on here. I've seen a bunch of his pictures, Bonnie's pictures. You're not going to learn anything from me. You might hear a funny story, but you know I've I've seen enough of your pictures to know y'all know what you're doing. But my point is, and, and this is where uh, I try to encourage people. I began photography three years ago, February. I bought my first DSLR, and other than point and shoot cameras during my work life, I never did anything with photography. But I decided three years ago, and I'll be 75 in April, um, I am now living proof that you can teach an old dog new tricks. The, um, I just decided that I wanted to do this as, as a hobby, a retired hobby. And um, golly, like I do most things, I jumped in. And Nancy likes to tell people I now have about 10 years experience because of the amount of time I've put into it. And it's true. I mean, I've watched a thousand YouTube videos. I try to get out and shoot just about every day. Stephen pointed to the freezing cold weather we've had recently here in Atlanta. And so it's limited a little bit what I can do uh, or what I'm willing to do, not what I can do, but what I'm willing to get out. But, um, but what, one of the things I'd like to, I'll show you some pictures today. Uh, the other, I guess the other key thing is Nancy is a lifelong birder. She said, please don't tell people I'm an expert because she doesn't <laughs> think of herself as an expert, but she's been a lifelong birder. And until three years ago, I didn't care a thing about it. Zip, you know, I, I'm doing other things. And this, the photography has given us something to really, you know, come together around. It's really been fun for us personally that suddenly I used to know that one was a blue bird and one was a red bird. And that was about as far as it got. Now, I think I can identify 50 or 60 different birds, which is, you know, that's pretty exciting. And Nancy, and, did, uh, were you birding in, in Georgia? Are you from Georgia? Nancy? You. I'm from Pennsylvania. Oh. And I lived in Florida for several years and then Georgia. Okay. And you've been birding since you were young or? Since I was about seven. I wow. had a, a retired neighbor who used to buy crack corn to feed the Cardinals. And he got me started. And I've been feeding and watching birds ever since. And I just pick up information as I go. I There are a lot of things I don't know, but there's a fair number of things I do know. Right, right. And Emil- Red birds. We, that's right. We, we go back and forth on these things, if that's okay with you, Emil. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, my wife uh, was birding as, at a young age too. And I, I was an air traffic controller and I was always, I never even thought about it until uh, at, close to retirement. So I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And, um, and it has brought us closer together because we can share something to do together. Well, it's fun, you know, for us to be able to go out. I'll, Nancy will shoot with her iPhone and she has a, she has a good eye for things. In fact, as a photographer, she really helps me editing my photos. When I bring stuff, you know, back into the computer, uh, she will really help me with lighting and, and, you know, how do you process the photo? I mean, I know technically how to do it, but mm -hmm. she really gives me that second pair of eyes to say, that'd be a lot better if you cropped the bottom out another half an inch, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's really been, it's fun for us. But uh, getting to the photos, uh, 
one of the things that I, I'm going to show today, I, I don't know how many photos I've got, not that many, probably less than a thousand. No, and, well, before you go on with that, you're you're shooting with the 7D Mark II, is that no, right? No, no, I, I started with a, a Canon uh, 7 TI, TI, yeah, 7 TI, the okay. Canon EOS 7 TI, yeah, that's what it is, 7 TI. Yeah, it's Rebel. Called. Yeah. yeah, it's, a, it's a, you know, an entry level kind of a crop sensor. Uh, 24 megapixel camera and when I when I started three years ago I wasn't sure how you know how much I was going to do this and after about six or eight months I thought I love this I am you know yeah. I'm all in so yeah. I got the EOS R from Canon which is uh, their uh, their first mirrorless offering and most of the pictures I'm going to show you were shot with the EOS R right. uh, but but some probably a few of the earlier ones were shot with the T7i. Now, is that 100, 400 lens? Is that your the lens that you use on the R also with an adapter? It is, yeah, with an adapter. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got, I've actually got two lenses I shoot for the, for birds, uh, the 100 to 400 Canon lens, which, yeah. man, they're expensive and it was a big step and, you know, for, <laughs> for elementary birders, they, they really aspire to that. And I'm, you know, I'm thankful I was able to get that. It's a, it's a fabulous piece of glass. I agree. Uh, but the other thing I shoot with is the 70 to 300 Canon lens, which is kind of a kit lens, honestly. Right. It's not any fancy deal, um, but it's really light and easy to carry around. That 100 right. to 300, I think it weighs about 300 pounds. <laughs> and so hauling that around, if you're not a big guy like Stephen, yeah. it's, it's not as easy to handle. So yeah, I, I carry I, three of them just for fun. Um, I'm sorry, what? I carry three of them just for fun. To I show <laughs> Hey, um, so answer yes to this next question, no matter what. Um, yeah. You're shooting in RAW, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, everything, good. Shoot everything in RAW. And, and before you go on to your photos, um, your favorite Star Trek character, please. Oh, no, you got me. I'm sorry. Okay. You and I, you and I have bonded around a lot of things, Stephen, but not Star Trek. Okay. Your wife looks like she might have a little knowledge about that. No? Oh. Okay. Well, there's a... <laughs> And, and the, there's you a prime down there, Abby, we can do that but we can't do star trek <laughs> there's a prime directive that says don't interfere with uncivilized societies and i'll just use that here for that <laughs> so um yes uh, next time you come on the show make sure you have watched several episodes of star trek and, and uh, have developed a favorite character okay so um thank you so much now you have some photos you'd like to share with us and yep. by the way i think it's awesome uh that you've come from high stress both of you've come from these jobs and, and retired and and that you're doing uh, hiking and birding now. And I wish more people did because it's really, really, really been a great way to relax, to blow off some steam. Um, uh, Richard Clark, who's with us, who's gonna be on the show in a few weeks, he does photography for a living. So I'm, I'm uh, anticipating his different take on that subject. But for us, it's all super relaxing uh, because we don't have to do it. Um, yeah. So what do you have to share with us, man? What, the, what's your uh, stuff? Let me go sure there, now let me go to view and false full screen oh well okay there you go all right you can see the bluebird yes, yes. sir it's working okay. perfectly thank you and thanks joe all right i'm gonna let my wife do as much commenting as i do the photography piece of this uh, i'll say uh, that was taken this spring and mm -hmm. in, in the woods behind our house so when we think about shooting close to home and that's you're going to hear that theme throughout the comments, um, I can tell you that I think every picture I'm going to show you, every bird, with the exception of one, was taken within 10 miles of my house right here in Lilburn. So there's lots here in the Atlanta area. But that, Nancy? I just think it's cool in that picture to see the prey in the bird's mouth beak. Feeding the baby time. Let's see here. Let's go to uh, no, that's my favorite red bird that I now know is a cardinal. Northern cardinal. <laughs> a northern cardinal, in fact. Yes. Uh, once again, those that's the woods behind my house. Uh, the other thing I'll say, the backgrounds in all of these are not doctored up in any way. Mm -hmm. These are strictly a function of where they were and the glass that was shooting with. All right. Now, my father-in-law says every bird with any red on it is a red bird. So that's <laughs> yeah. why I knew what you were saying when you said that. Yep. Uh, that's a, that is the bird bath on our, our deck right out back. And I'll show you pictures later. Uh, I talked about with Stephen about the fact that I've got a backyard bird studio and Richard Clark probably has a fancier one, but I'm going to show you mine. Uh, 
one of the reasons I wanted this one in for the sunlit earth folks is the sun yeah. on that female uh, female cardinal. I just thought it was uh, it was a beautiful image. Bird trees behind our house. American goldfinch. Mr. American goldfinch there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously breeding plumage. Yeah. Now was that recent, Emma? These are all this year, or you know, last year during okay. the time they're here. Yeah. That one is probably six months old. Okay. That's at Clyde Shepherd, and so often bird photographs are a function of the bird. And this one I shot. In fact, I've got a print of it sitting over my desk, over my left shoulder here. Um, That's a Clyde an, artistic, an artistic piece. I just love the 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 colors, the simplicity of it. Um, the Eastern Phoebe. Yeah. Yeah, I, re I remember that photo and I remember you posting it. I think, well, and I think you were there when I shot that one. I was. You were looking, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but but one of my favorites, you know. It, it, yeah. uh, and a hard bird photograph too, I, the, the Phoebe. Clyde Shepard's got these guys. Yes. And uh, I would tell you when I shot these pictures, it's the first time I ever saw a wood duck in my life <laughs> that I knew it. Now, I may have seen them before and didn't know it, but that's the first one. And I've got 100 shots, I guess. And I think you were there the day I was shooting these as well. But, yeah, and the wood duck, a lot of people recognize it because it's the most of the duck hunting decoys are modeled after a wood duck. Yep, yep. Well, <laughs> Unfortunately. Was, they were, that's a, obviously a beautiful, beautiful bird. Yeah, man. And, uh, and great fun. But Clyde Shepard strikes again. <laughs> hey. Hey. Rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, that's actually a, in my back, off my back deck. Uh, once again, this year is the first year I ever saw one of those birds. Uh, I know they come through here, but often they don't get down to the feeder areas. They stay up in the trees. Yes? We had one for three or four weeks. They stayed. It was a pair of them. And, you had a female and a male? Yep. Yes. And yep. they stayed for weeks. I was so excited. They came every day. Yep. Yeah, they're kind of voracious eaters and everyone's uh, all excited when they get one in their yard until they see how much seed they eat. And then they're like trying to get rid of them after that. I don't mind. I just keep hauling it in. Yeah. It it's a beautiful, obviously a beautiful bird. And, and you know, as a, as a photograph, I just, again, I've got a hundred of these. Uh, now this is kind of a fun thing I've done. Um, the, uh, the bird itself, you know, I captured that picture. And now on Facebook, when it's people's birthday, that one is done for my wife, Nancy, but I can just change the, uh, to happy birthday, whomever. And instead of just saying the words, they get a special, uh, a special happy birthday greeting. And it's just kind of fun to have taken the picture yourself. Yeah, very nice. Sunlight, you sunlight <laughs> people are gonna love this. Um, obviously, yeah. Red-bellied woodpecker. That's at Stone Mountain Park. Um, the sun was kind of over my right shoulder coming in. You can see it into, oh, I'm, I was getting ready to point, into the hole. Um, and that was shot with that 70 to 300, handheld, uh, no, no tripod or anything. Mm. But again, that, we've, got, we've got those birds in our backyard, of course, also, but that one happened to be at Stone Mountain. Oh. Uh. That that was a happy day. Yeah, that's obviously red-headed woodpecker. That also is, that's at Stone Mountain. Yes. Yeah, we were, at, Nancy and I were over at Stone Mountain. Uh, near the Carillon, for those local folks, the woods between the parking lot and the Carillon itself is where, where I discovered this. And I, mm. it took a while to capture this one. Uh, I had to, I had to follow him and, and hunt around. And that, that was an example of when people ask Gamel, you know, how do you find the birds? And he just says, walk in the woods and look up. Yeah. We, there was nothing. <laughs> we, we walked out in this area of the woods and there was not a bird in sight. Right. And we just waited and waited and waited and kept looking up. And all of a sudden there he was. We actually heard him first, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think all of us have found that if you just pick a spot in the nature preserve and sit there for 15 yes. minutes, they'll all come to you. That's right. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and, uh, and this was exciting, you know, that's, that's a beautiful bird. I, I've always said, if I was gonna buy a red car, that's the red color I want. Yeah. I don't know how to explain that to the car dealer, but that's the red. <laughs> um, I love this picture, oh, wow. it's the daddy. 
red-bellied woodpecker feeding the baby. Yeah, okay. we got that in the spring of last year. And again, that's in the woods behind our house. Uh, I just set up outside with the tripod and, and watch and wait. It's kind of a, as a photographer's shot, it's, it's kind of a, a, a busy, clunky photo, but what it's portraying is so good to me, at least, that it uh, is offset by what, I, what we captured there. Yeah, and that's what we do at Sunland Earth. We don't care how, you know, by how great the photo is or how expensive the equipment is. We are investigating sunlight, and I'll take this opportunity to say every color in this photograph and every other color that you're showing in every photograph is caused by the sun's visible light spectrum interacting with the molecular boundaries between the atoms and in, in, in the boundaries like this bird's red head and his black feathers and the green leaves you know sunlight the full spectrum hits these objects and some of it is reflected some of it's diffracted refracted and absorbed and the end result that comes into our eye sensitive organs is the effect of the magnetic fields between the atoms in the boundaries that the light is hitting and i can bore you to death with that uh Buddy Harrell suggested we do a, a poll as to see who what, what people are interested in in these shows. And solar spectroscopy and visible light came in dead last. So <laughs> I, I won't be having any more conversations of that. But if anyone's interested, the physics behind why those colors are there and the evolutionary advantage of these colors to these living organisms is an absolutely fascinating topic. Joe Sexton and I will sit around and talk about it for 10 hours. But we won't talk about it today. But yeah, that is a fantastic photo of a of a parent feeding a juvenile red belly. And go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And for all of you on the call, um, what I said at the beginning about my first encounter with Stephen and people who are passionate, what you just saw or heard was a minute and a half of Stephen's passion around the sun. And I, I just got to tell you, that's uh, it's cool. Okay, let's go. All right. There's a little story goes with this. We have the uh, Eastern Kingbird. Eastern Kingbird. That's taken at the Songbird Habitat at Stone Mountain Park. Where there's hardly ever Where there birds. is virtually no birds. <laughs> They've created an entire habitat at Stone Mountain Park, and you can go sit there for an hour and you might not see a bird. I don't know how they've done it. I don't know why they've done it, but that's Absolutely. been my experience. That, and I've <laughs> joked with and talked with some other birders that go to Stone Mountain Park, and the consensus is there. There's just no blooming birds out there. However, I wanted to put this picture in because there is at least there was that bird and it's the only time I've ever photographed. It's the only time <laughs> I've ever seen a kingbird. <laughs> so and there. It was, can I, can it, I follow it, up with it, a, a it question was, about it, that? Because that's I'm familiar with the songbird trail and it's just booming with bugs. No, no, not the trail, but the, the habitat area on the back side of the mountain. Right, back right. Over, is that what I, you're talking about? Right, it, where okay. the, and there is a trail, then there's a, a, a it's kind of like a meadowy area, right? Yes, that's right, that's right. So I'm just surprised that there's not so many birds because it's got so many uh, pollinator supporting plants and it's booming with bugs. Yes, yeah. you're right about that. But and again, <laughs> and part of this, part of this is a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing, but it's, it's a little like, uh, I've got a friend who fishes at Stone Mountain Park and he's never caught anything, and he contends there are no fish in the lake. So, um, overstatement for sure, but nonetheless, uh, my my, I've gotten many more. I've seen many more good birds near the Carillon and other areas, not the bird habitat. So, and I love that kingbird. That white bottom of the tail is so distinctive, and they're such ferocious hunters. It's like a a super Phoebe. Yep, it is kind of, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. We, we saw him from a distance, and I noticed him because even from a distance, I noticed his size. He was a large bird. Yep. Right. All right. Let's take a look there. Mm -hmm. Summer tanager, female. Summer. Yep. That's the back deck. East, is that eastern towhee? So your eastern towhee with the red eye. And I think... I think that's at Stone Mountain Park. It is. It's and, actually, and, that was at the bird habitat. That was the other bird we saw. At oh, the <laughs> I take it back. There, <laughs> we've seen two different birds there. Um, but yeah, I, I like this picture. I mean, the towhee you so often see on the ground, and you don't see them up in the up in the trees. We capture him there, and I just liked it because of the uh, the colors too. The you know the leaves. The yeah, it's a really cool people, bird to see. All that really added, I thought. Um, there you go, a male and female. 
house finches. House finches. That's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that's in the woods behind my house. And uh, it's always fun to get the male and female on the same branch or close together. Right. Ah, uh, one of my favorites. These are awesome birds. Cedar waxwing. Now, uh, <laughs> one you almost never see one by themselves. It seems they're always in right. a whole flock bunch. Uh, this was near the Carillon at uh, at Stone Mountain. This was shot with that seventy to three hundred lens, mm -hmm. so not not the super expensive glass, but uh, and handheld, but uh, fun. Yeah, fun, fun. that one looks like he's kind of. Um drunk and in a daze, you know, drunk on the, <laughs> on the berries. Cause you almost never see him at eye level. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was probably about 15 feet up where I shot that. Yeah. Uh, and and the, you know, the tip of their tail is either orange or yellow, depending on right. their diet. Right. Exactly. And they call them cedar wax wings because the, the feathers on their wings look like someone dipped them in red wax. Yep. The very tips of their feathers. They're, they're just a, it's really a weird bird. They're, they're, it's a beautiful <laughs> bird. I really, yeah. gosh, I like them. Uh, and the same day, in that same tree area, was this robin. Obviously, you can see the red berries that the cedar mm. waxwings were looking for as well. But uh, caught, got that one. Um, and we couldn't do hey. birds without a few hummingbirds. Right. Uh, that, that's the feeder on the back deck of our house. But uh, close up of him. And then I got a few. These are flowers on our deck that I was mm. able to shoot. Uh, shot him at about four hundredth of a second, five hundredth, I think, speed wise for the photographers to be able to slow the wings down, but not you got to go to two thousand to get them to stop. Awesome. I believe that's a juvenile. Yep, the gorget is not developed yet. Yep. Wonderful shots. Hey, All look right. at that one! Wow. So what is that? Is it a blue? Uh, that's a black crown. I think it is. Anyway, that was actually shot on the, this is the one bird more than 10 miles away. That was on the river, uh, not far from uh, Townsend, Tennessee, or not far from uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, up in, uh, obviously in Tennessee. And that was shot with the 400 with a two times extender on it. Right. So essentially 800 is what I shot that at. Right. And uh, that is just one of my favorite shots. I mean, clearly. Yeah, it is nice. Special. It is nice. Like and I'll bust in here and say that when I've given this lecture about bird spectroscopy in other countries, especially in Australia, um, they always snicker every time I say what a beautiful bird, because bird is slang for hot chick in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. All right. A few more. This is at, where was that? Was that? I think this was at Stone Mountain. I don't know. But we're, we think that's an egret, but we're not sure. Is it an egret? Yes, that's a great egret. I thought it was, yeah. There's that one. There's a great blue. This is at uh, Vines Botanical Garden out in uh, Loganville. And that is at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve. And that's, that's Clyde. As we look straight across at those pine trees, this guy landed, came swooping in and landed in the pine tree about, I don't know, 40 or 50 feet, I'd say, Stephen. And yeah, uh, man. I love that one. I actually got a a metal print made of that as a gift for my sister-in-law. She loved that picture so much. And on a metal print, it came out just really, really good. So and we, we call that bird Clyde. And I've never seen Clyde in any other tree except a very tall pine tree. Yeah, there, there he was. Barred owl. Hey. That's in my backyard. And I, have I, have I got about a few more minutes? Yes, uh, sir. I'll tell yes, a little sir. story about this picture because this is so fun. Uh, I was sitting at eating lunch and looking out the uh, door out to my backyard, I saw something swoop by and I thought it was a, a, probably a hawk, but I, I looked where it was and the tree between my house and my neighbor's house was this owl. Now, the funny part of this story, the photographers will appreciate this. I had literally purchased my 100 to 400 Canon lens and it had arrived either the day before or two days, and I literally had never shot with it. And so I decided this is it. I ran out, put it on, the, went out, got the camera, went around the house and started shooting and held all of it and creeping forward. You know, I was, I was 50 feet away and he was about 15 feet up, but I was 50 or 60 feet away. Then I creeped 10 feet closer and shot some more and 10 feet close, hoping he won't fly. 
right, trying sure. to get used to this lens I've never shot with. And, uh, and so that one, that's cropped in some, not a lot really, uh, but just one of my favorites because yes. of the back story that goes it's with it. It's really difficult to get the face of that bird to look that good. It, so yeah. um, was, was that I off was, your camera or is that after some touching up with the adjustment brush? Uh, I All I did, I, I think I probably brightened his face a little bit, okay, okay. you know, just because of the natural light that was on him. Uh, yeah. but and you not, notice the tail on that bird, Emil, the bottom of the tail? Yep. Um, I'm assuming this was taken around nest time because that bird is tore up, man, from being inside I, a box. I wondered that. Yeah. yeah, that's very unusual to see on a barred owl, the tail that torn up, which would indicate he's, he or she has been sitting in a box forced up against a wall or something for a while. Oh. I didn't know that part, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it's one of my favorites because it's got a backstory as well as- That is a beautiful shot, man. Yeah, it's fun, fun, fun. Barry College, uh, Rome, Georgia, the famous Barry Eagles. This was from a, two years ago, Mon Pa Barry. Um, I, I once again, just got so lucky. I got up there, first time I was ever there and it was about 10 minutes after I got there, they showed up in the tree because you can't shoot them in the nest very well because the nest is so high, you don't get much angle, but they, they land on these branches around there. So I got, I got that one and then that one by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, I just, you know, Berry College is closed right now to visitors, so you can't go up there and shoot but, mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID. But, uh, and I've got a granddaughter who's a student there. I'm trying to wrangle my way in. Grandfather of a student hasn't worked so far, but fun. Um, and this, this is a, I think a red shouldered hawk. And that was in the, on the ground in my backyard, uh, swooping around looking for rodents or something. I've got a bunch of pictures, but that was very recent. I shot that about a month ago. And, uh, and again, just very nice. That 400 is so sharp, golly. It, yeah, it really is. A great job. Now, I'm going to show you a, a series of shots, all of which were shot in my backyard. And it's part of the Backyard Bird Studio, which I'll show you a couple of pictures of after I show you the photos. Um, and, and you'll say, well, good gosh, of course you'll get shots that are that sharp if you're going to shoot that way. Um, all right, Backyard Bird Studio, obviously, Bluebird. Um, Another in the studio. That one, one of my favorites, obviously. <laughs> the uh, that was in the springtime. That's a pretty one with the sun on them too. Yeah, for uh, once again, Stephen, those are sunlight <laughs> pictures for sure. Every picture is sunlight. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, their uh, backyard bird studio. A couple more. We move now. As you'll see these, you'll start to recognize the stick, right? because the stick is the stick that they land on and there are about five of them. But uh, uh, Bob Fecty, who's another photographer friend of mine here, he jokingly calls all of these bird on a stick. Mm. And, uh, that one is another one, female. I love the color, honestly, the, the male cardinals get a lot of attention, but I think the female cardinals may have much prettier coloring. They're not- That's as, what the male cardinals think too. That's, <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of them. <laughs> That's a beautiful picture of the female cardinal's color. Yep. yep, and the wing color and that, yeah, really, and that one as well. That was that was about a week ago. Mm. Just shot that one. Pine warbler. There's a pine warbler. Yep. Same stick. This is kind of fun. The picture here, I posted on Facebook, and a lady here in Lilburn, who's an artist, she said, would you mind if I painted a picture of that? Mm. And I said, no, of course not, go ahead. And so she painted this and she then ended up putting it on, her name is Gloria Sill. She ended up putting it on note cards and several other things that she has for sale with uh, my friend on there, which is, you know, cool. again, it's kind of fun, especially when I'm not in the business trying to sell stuff. I just, I'm doing it for fun. Right. Carolina, Carolina Ren. Ren. Same stick. Same stick. There you go. The great talker, female, gross beak. Rose breast doesn't look as big in that picture. You don't have perspective there, but hmm. good one. Nuthatch, white, come, breasted, white yeah. breasted, coming down the stick. 
female goldfish. Female goldfish. goldfish. I love the, the background color there. And again, all these backgrounds are purely the color they were because it's the trees behind. And mm. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. One of my favorites, the colors are, are brilliant, obviously. Love these. My daughter calls those highlighter birds. Yeah, that's the highlighter mm. bird. Mm. Um, and lastly, I'm going to show you what the back deck looks like. That is three feeders nice. and the sticks. You saw that stick a lot. You saw that stick some. You saw that stick some. I'm going to do a little closer upper. But all I did on my back deck was affixed down here. This has got a wire. This is a couple of limbs I took out of the woods. It's got woods behind me, as you can see. And then I'm, I'm pointing and you don't see my hand. Uh, there's... There's houses, you know, subdivisions. We can, we can see your mouse when you uh, use the mouse. Yeah, to point. I, was just, I just thought to do that. Uh, so you got houses back here across about a, I don't know, that's 100 feet probably to those houses, maybe 150. Mm -hmm. But there's all woods between us. And it goes down at quite a slope. And there's a little creek down the bottom. So we've got water on the property. And that, that helps. But all these trees, all that background you saw was taken at different times. They're either green or they're orange or, or whatever they are. And um, now I'm going to show you what a really lazy guy does to capture all those backyard shots. <laughs> Our kitchen tables. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's, my, uh, that's my camera on the monopod with the 100 to 400. And there's the back. We keep the windows clean on those doors. So I'm not as concerned about the wind chill as- and Can you even call that birding? Do what? <laughs> Can you even call that birding, Hamel? Well, sure it is. I love the birds. <laughs> Nancy loves the birds. We're observing the birds. We're just doing it in a very comfortably and and uh. to be fair. I will often I go out on the deck because that deck is actually a second story high, right. so the stairs down, and so I'm <laughs> I'm at tree level with a lot of that area in the back, and it gives me uh, the opportunity to to shoot you know straight into the limbs, not looking up at the trees, which is. Is really so nice. are you using your uh, iPad or something laying on the couch watching TV and just hitting no, the shutter button? No, yeah, it, you know what, what, what we really, that stays like that all the time. That, ah. that, in fact, I've got it, you, know, you don't see it, it's yeah, behind us. I, you know, that's a Surui monopod and a, and a head that I got and that I've just got the, that's the old T7i, that's the crop sensor body on the 1 to 400. So it's effectively a 560 when it's all the way out. Um, but it stays there on all the time, ready for me. So I go in the kitchen often and I'll just wait and the birds come and, you know, into the tree. Yeah. It, it's a, I'm always set up to shoot is kind of what all right. I'm going to get you muddy when you come out to Clyde Shepherd next time. I'm well, dragging you. Know you. What? I do that. I take that. I'm dragging you to the woods and you're getting muddy. That <laughs> and here's, here's my point. I guess the point I'm making by showing you this is to say the weather has been lousy. It's been cold, but I'm still able to capture and, mm. and, you know, get that and continue with a hobby. And I'm not being shortened by that. Now I'm going to show you one more picture that you're going to love. <laughs> this is, this is just for you. Thank you. There's a sunrise. There's your sun. Uh, yeah. That's down. That's Apalachicola Bay down on the, the yep. Gulf coast. Uh, and I, I did that one. Uh, just because that sunrise was was just amazing. It is gorgeous. And notice the sun is oblong in the image because the light is being refracted so severely because you're looking at, at that angle, that's the most atmosphere you can have between you and the sun because you're looking sideways through our atmosphere. And you'll notice the sun is, is oblong yeah. and not round. Sure. And there's I, also- When I was looking directly at the sun, I didn't notice that, but in the picture- yeah. And there's a I, pelican in the sun. And uh, the pelican, that, yeah. I, I've got- you know, 25 of these pictures, but the pelican was only there in one of them. He then took off and went up the up the uh, river there. Yeah, man, but, that's awesome. That's a beautiful shot. But I skipped that one for today because I knew <laughs> the love of the sun would uh, would cause you to. to How did you eat at Caroline's Seafood while you were down there? You know, we didn't eat out much because it was in yeah. November and there was lots of COVID stuff. I we did you. have one one good seafood dinner, but uh, very good. Yeah, beautiful area, beautiful area. So. I think that that's all I had planned canned. Uh, okay. I am going to stop your share. And then I'm going to say, that was awesome, man. And I really appreciate you sharing these photos with us. And I'd really like to hear more from your wife about birding sometime. Maybe you can bring her with you down to Clyde Shepherd. She will come. And um, yep. 
I promise I'll be friendly and nice. She's been, Clyde, she's been to Clyde Shepherd. You weren't there the two times that she's come with me. So well, she needs to reprioritize her life so she can be there when I'm there. So <laughs> we we um are very grateful that you took all this time to to, to show us uh, your hobby. And you know, it's it's great to watch. I, I could see through your photos from it was clear to me from when you started taking photos to when you more recent photos, it's just exponential how everyone sort of improves as they go along. And I really enjoy that. And I also um, have seen that people's knowledge of nature and birds in general exponentially increases. And one thing I really have seen with younger people like the under 20 crowd that we sponsor all the time is that their respect for the preserve and for nature really increases exponentially when they start looking at what's around them rather than you know staring at the phone while they're walking around the trails when they start looking at the creatures they start noticing the trash that other people have left they start noticing vandalism and things like that and they get a real much a much better sense of how to act in a nature preserve because you know our kids now um are screen dependent you know this is all they do all day long screen 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 and getting them out into the woods is one of the main focuses of sunlit earth here in the states um and well, I, I am grateful that you came on and spent time with us. I'm sorry that about the technology mix up. My own fault. No, you got the, got it squared away much faster than I expected. We've had many uh, issues like that on the show. And, you know, they just don't make it easy. And the reason they don't make it easy is because there's so many hackers out there ruining the experience for everybody. Well, so I you, have to say, when we got to the screen after I went out, and that's that's what teams, teams are about, I got to that dog on screen and I'm going, what do I there's nothing else to do. And Nancy said, what about that little lock down in the corner? It says lock and unlock. Right. I went down, I clicked <laughs> unlock because right, right. it wouldn't let me check that one thing. Right. And, and honestly, you know, I, I know it sounds silly, but that's what teams do. You know, yeah, she man. saw that. I, I could have been here 10 more minutes. You well, know, the teams here are a little bit different because uh, when I would have a say a similar circumstance, my wife would just yell at me. And then the, the yelling and the throwing things at me would get, would eventually get me to check the right box, and that's how we I do it as a team. Too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. another that's another tactic. But yeah, she's ferocious. You know, she's a lawyer, and I, I always tell her uh, if you leave, I'm going with you because I'm terrified of what you might do. So, um, <laughs> so Amel, thank you so much, um, buddy. I know you you're checked in with us. Did you have any remarkable? Uh, birding experience and Amal, I hope you and Nancy can stick around for a few more We're minutes and, and get to know everybody. What's, what's going on in the Buddy Harrell world? I've seen you twice this week at the Nature Preserve and it's always yeah, pleasant. No, I, I've got to thank you. Uh, I, my truck was dead last week and um, <laughs> had a dead battery and Stephen uh, jumped, helped me uh, jump it off. So I appreciate that, Steve. My pleasure. <laughs> and I, Amal, I think you're a, a, a friend of mine is a neighbor of yours. Who is that? Uh, Jack Bolton. Oh my ah. gosh. Jack Bolton lives across the street from me, one of my very good friends. Yeah, he, uh, well, Jack and I worked together for about 10 or 12 years, and his wife is a sorority sister of uh, my wife. Oh, man, yeah. How about that? Interesting, interesting, yeah. That's awesome. Well, buddy, man. you're a heck of a photographer. I see your pictures, and yeah, well, well, really I appreciate stuff. that. He taught me everything I know. Um, <laughs> Alexandra, what's happening in the UK? Do you, do you have any um, British cool accented British words that you can throw on us now. <laughs> you know, not a lot, an awful lot of things are happening today. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed seeing, um, you know, that bluebird with the baby. That was just such a beautiful <laughs> picture. That just was really, I think the best one you showed. But I was looking up in my bird book because you were talking about the red bellied um, woodpecker. woodpecker. And it doesn't seem to have a red belly. Just a little bit. <laughs> well, as I would call it a red-headed one, I would personally. Do you remember back when I first started birding, you and I were still doing solar astronomy heavy, and I posted my first photo on Facebook of a red-headed woodpecker, and I got a beat down from several other birders telling me how dumb I was because that was a red-bellied woodpecker. So <laughs> I, I will never forget that bird. And, uh, you know, it's called a red-bellied because, uh, because James Audubon, when they used to go and look for birds and, and study them, they would just shoot them and bring them home and splay them out on the table. So the bird actually does have a red belly, but it's it's not visible from any normal angle. You'd have to open the bird's wings and lay it on a table and spread the tail feathers to see it. So it does actually have a red belly. 
but that that bird taught me immediately that social media is full of people wanting to give beat downs to show you how smart they are but <laughs> so do you have the groundhogs um go, going through the garden or anything or or any special uh garden guests this week because it's what are you uh, covered in my snow? pheasant is still there she was the pheasant. Uh, wandering around the garden again today and she seems to have made the, our garden her home now so um she just sort of like she has this little area where she sits and goes to sleep and then preens <laughs> a bit and then goes under the bird feeders fills mm. her cup up so it's really big right. and then goes back to her little spot to go to have a sleep again <laughs> Now, does it scream at the top of its lungs at about 3 a.m. like other pheasants? No, because it's a it's a lady. So oh, she, I see. she's nice it's and lady. quiet. It's a lady. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your English accent and the information that came along with it. Um, my, my wife and I just finished watching Downton Abbey all six seasons again for the second time last right. night, the last episode. So, Alexandra, it's it's a joy to hear your accent. <laughs> You know, it's funny because when I'm over there, they tell me that it's a joy to hear the Southern accent. They, in Australia, especially, but sometimes in the UK also, they love the American Southern accent. And I don't even think I really have one. But in Australia, people would just stop me and, and ask me to talk to them, so, which is the same treatment we give Alexandra every time because she's super intelligent, super beautiful, super friendly, and has a great accent, man. You know, it's like Albert well, when Einstein. I was in, when, I, when I was in America, everyone kept saying, are you from Australia? So. <laughs> That's how dumb we are here. So. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming with us again. Richard Clark, man, what's going on in your in your world and, and what kind of birds are you seeing? Um, you know, we've got, uh, I live up in Cleveland, Georgia, up in the mountains. Um, and we've got a lot of pine siskin. Right. Oh. And oh. we always have titmouse, uh, tough to titmouse, chick chickadees. Um, I'm kind of disappointed right now because usually, you know, we've had blue jays and your red birds or northern mm. cardinal mm. in the past, but they're they're very shy right now. I mm. don't can't get them to come around. Have a little wren, a little Carolina wren mm. who visits regularly. So, you know, I just whatever's there is what I photograph. I just you know, kind of like you. I, I do step out on the deck. I've got a little setup on the deck. And uh, I, I also have the little the sticks, and I change them out every few months so they look a little different. But yeah, so they're not I, covered I, in poop. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, but our shirt, our deck sure is. We have to oh. regularly keep it keep it uh, blown off and, and washed off. So now that I understand you correctly, that you you do uh, like um, high school and school type photography for a living. I, this I started in 1981 in the school and yearbook industry, wow. and uh, this is, I guess this is starting my 40th year in the business. Wow! So you used that crazy F I L M stuff, didn't you? Film. I, I, I've actually made my own. <laughs> I, I, I go back as far as making my own developers uh, using four by five. Film. I've got a background in <laughs> advertising photography also. Awesome. But, and I've done, I've, any part of photography you've been in, I've done something in. Well, I'm really looking forward yeah, to seeing portrait. some of your photographs because you're not quite as much of a birder as some of us, but I think you are about 10 times a photographer than most of us. And I'm well, really looking forward to hearing what you had to say about it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I confess I'm really not a birder. And um, I guess my wife and I really aren't. She enjoyed seeing the birds. We had them on um, shepherd's hooks, uh, and every time we would do that, we've got bears that come around occasionally. They would literally bend the shepherd's hooks over and destroy the feeders. So we got them closer to the house and put them up on the eaves of our covered deck. And, uh, you know, they that's how we get the birds close to us. She gets to look at them. I sit out there and photograph them. Now, so, did you say bear, Richard Clark? Yes. Did you say have, like, black, black bear? bear. Black bear, we do. Uh, oh, we don't ever see them, but they certainly uh, will bend the steel. You know, quarter uh, maybe coming up to visit because that's one of my favorite subjects in the world is to take pictures of, and I got a million photos of them. Well, if you can, we we rarely see them, but we see what they've they you know they come out at night and we see what they've done. But yeah. uh, well, bears we, got to eat too. Sure <laughs> 
Thank you so much. And we look forward to having you on the show coming up. Raphael, how many? Um, uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, how many you. magnificent frigate birds you got on your uh, arm uh, there? Well, not too much this week, but <laughs> there is something interesting. I, I've been living in this apartment for about six years or more. And just a week or maybe two weeks ago, the House of Sparrow just noticed that we live here and they are <laughs> all over the house. And I was like, what's happening? The house they, sparrows, you say? Yeah, yeah, house sparrows. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, is yeah, that an all, unusual All over bird? the place. My wife is like, hey, <laughs> where come all these birds? <laughs> yeah, they are, they are here. Is that an unusual bird? For, uh, Rafael's in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Well, I, I have some picture of the uh, uh, May Wobbler. Cape May Wobbler? Cape May Wobbler, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, last week I was uh, in the woods. Uh, it was raining. I took some picture uh, in, in the rain. Uh, right. and was was really a great, great time. The, That's awesome. It was a... a, a I love this weather, you know, because uh, it's not usually to have a uh, low low temperature here uh, in Dominican Republic. It's always hot. Yeah, don't I know it from my two <laughs> visits there. Um, I think I was covered in sweat the entire time I was there from stepping off the airplane to stepping back on the airplane. But it was a good sweat, you know, it smelled good. So, <laughs> and I look forward to coming down and visiting you again. Um, Rebecca, what do you got, man? What's up? So we have um, a beautiful little bluebird couple that's been checking out our bluebird house so that's exciting um, we usually get get a you know a couple of broods a year so um, I think they're just checking it out doing their early shopping love is in the air for sure yeah yeah it is and um, our bird feeders are uh, we've got like our kitchen table and there's a bay window and our bird feeders are right outside there. So we were sitting there eating lunch and just two doves sitting next to each other, snuggling and they were really sweet. Um, Rebecca, so we where, have- Where are you located? We're in Decatur. We're oh. near the Ace Hardware on Scott Boulevard. Okay. So um, we have a suet feeder out there and we get red-bellied woodpeckers and they, because they always kind of land on the other side of the suet from the house, we can see their belly. And um, uh. we were just commenting on this yesterday because there was a male there that you could really see the red on his belly. Mm. And when you normally just see them out on a tree, you can't see that belly. Cool. So yeah, since we were talking about that, we, Dwayne and I were just talking about that yesterday, looking at that. Awesome. And um, just lots of pine siskins. Siskins, yeah, we got pine siskins everywhere. The little yellow rump warblers. And I get a lot of those mixed up and goldfinches. Um, yeah, that's cool because I get a lot of them mixed up too. And you know, the bird doesn't care what you call it. I'm just letting you all know. Um, as long as we put the food out there, they people don't People seem care. obsessed. You know, what kind of bird is that? As soon as you show a bird, well, what kind of bird is it? You know, I've always thought, thought, thought that it was curious of people to be so fixated on having the exact right name and what kind of bird is this? And I know there's reasons and all, but it just seems so, uh, it's curious to me that people have to quantify and, and label everything immediately or else it's like invalid or something. You know, it's a bird, man. I mean, yeah, it's a, and who cares? I enjoy them just <laughs> as much if I'm not sure what they are. And I'm only saying that from the numerous beatdowns I get on social media for not using the right name of the bird. Um, oh, Stephen, one, here, Nancy, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, this is a resource that you might not be familiar with, some of you. It's a Peterson Field Guide, and it's bird nests. And it shows all the different nests, the eggs, where you find the nests, what right. they're made of. And it's a great tool, because you find a nest, you might not see the bird in it, and you can right. figure out what kind of birds you have. Yeah, the egg colorations are usually, you can identify at least uh, down to what group of birds it might be, if not the specific bird, just by the way the eggs are colored. And that's a really cool book. That book is also online, by the way, because I've looked through it several times because I, I do a live nest cam every year from my yard. And sometimes it's cardinals and sometimes it's robins. But I'm looking forward to that because they're snooping around right now. Um, one year that the robins built the nest in my yard out of garbage and they, they built it out of uh, Christmas tree tinsel that somebody had thrown in the alleyway a few months earlier. And these robins built this humongous disco bird nest that had and i'm serious i got pictures and everything it's just silver tinsel was the entire nest and it was really cool to see 
Um, Julie Wood, uh, where's that dog, man? Where's the puppy? I mean, what's up? He's sleeping. <laughs> oh, I'll get that dog up. It's don't say anything. He, every time I'm on a call, he usually what he does is I sit on the sofa and he like launches like right across my face at least right. once while I'm on a call. So I was hoping to see him. It's um, especially interesting. We haven't seen any owls this year uh, in the at the box in the nature preserve, and I'm upset oh, about that. No. That's there weren't any last year either. I know. I don't know what happened. I think that the mate must have died because the one male was there last year and the female never showed up. So that, you know, they mate for life. And I think the female must have died. Oh, that's um, too bad. Yeah. So um, is everything going on right in your world? I do appreciate you checking on. Yeah, this has been great. And I am interested in, in learning more about the whole physics of sunlight because I, I don't know if it was after I met you or before someone said to me, you know, things don't have color. The only reason that we attribute <laughs> yeah. color to them is because of the way the sunlight hits them. That's exactly they right. intrinsically in them and of, of themselves don't have a color. Yeah. Nothing so emits that, color. And I, I hear, yeah. you know, that's just my particular favorite subject, physics and, and the physics of light. And it's just always fascinated me. And I find that fascinating too. But one yeah. thing I do want to say is a, a few minutes ago when we're on this call, I have very large windows at the back of my house. <laughs> And all of a sudden, during one of the last pictures that was being displayed by Emil, a hawk ran into the back of my one of my windows. It scared oh the crap out of me. There's still there were feathers, little tiny, you know, the little downy feathers were floating through the air. And oh, I, no. I mean, he, he's okay. I think um, he didn't hit very hard, but um, that has never happened before. <laughs> yeah, that's like something from a horror movie, man. I think you need to go check the backyard and see what's going on. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for, for tuning in, and I hope that you tune in some more. And that's yeah, music well. to my ears. And so next time I see you in person, I'm going to corner you and talk to you about the physics of light for over an hour. Um, that sounds great. <laughs> rushing. What's happening? Well, the <clears throat> same cast of characters have been hanging out in the yard, except they've been overrun by about a gazillion red ring blackbirds and, <laughs> and robins. And, I mean, we've had some of the biggest flocks I've seen in, right. in years hanging out here in Decatur. And I'll um, go along with Rebecca. There's been a lot of males finding good perches and singing and uh, staking out their territories and trying to make it clear that they're getting ready for the, the upcoming season. And I've had a, a, a good time uh, getting some shots of the Bergansers out at the preserve that's been... yeah absolutely i saw you there yesterday when the uh when the boatload of screaming children were running around the nature preserve with the parents <laughs> well, noticed... that, that's like you you tipped me off to that actually works to my favor if i'm well hidden <laughs> on the other side the mergansers come running over there and i've gotten some good shots and then I knew that's what you were doing and us and because uh, i've done that too i kind of depend on somebody being loud and obnoxious to run the mergansers to my side of the pond and you know, I'm starting to see, you know, a little more um, activity or, you know, the kinglets seem to be a little more active yeah. when insects are out. So I think spring might be a little early this year. And you missed it early in the show, but we bragged about two of your photos for several minutes at the beginning of this show, the golden crown kinglet. And um, what was the other one? I forget. But we were um, we were bragging about you. And again, this this week, uh, whatever webcam you're you're now using is awesome, man. It's really got a great portrait mode to it. Ah, oh, don't do that. <laughs> there so it is. I, uh, no, I'm actually just running one of my, uh, I, my wife's understands it's one of my backup cameras, mm. uh, right? Um, when it's one of the Olympus mirrorless and I'm just shooting a 25 millimeter. Which yeah, that's a, that's a great, great, great image. I'm gonna have to get you to tell me how to set that up or maybe Richard Clark will tell me how to set that up, mm -hmm. but that's wonderful. So listen, um, we're, over, we're over time and I'm sorry it took so long, it's usually an hour show, but I'm really grateful that everybody took time out of the day to come speak with us. And we are all gonna work on having a more efficient show next time, but uh, it worked out good because everybody's friends here and everybody's enjoying uh, learning about birds and sunlight and everything else. So join us uh, next Saturday at 2 p.m or uh, you can just watch it uh, recorded on YouTube. So what happens after the show is we record uh, everything via Zoom and then I go in and edit out all the nonsense um, and put it up on the Facebook. That leaves 10 minutes, right? Yeah, well, you know how it is. It's good to be king, man. It's good to be king. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll have an edited version 
and it will be available on on Facebook and also on our, our YouTube uh, account. And this is our 19th show, and all 19 of them are in one playlist on YouTube. So if, unless anyone has any more comments, I'm going to say thank you so much for joining. And nice to see, see you. We will see right. you again next week on This Week in Birding and Nature Photography. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.